What are algorithms, and why are they so useful? In this video, we will be exploring what an algorithm is, especially what an efficient algorithm is, and why they are so useful in performing certain tasks. Algorithms A direct definition from Google points that an algorithm is a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem-solving operations, especially by a computer. So in simple terms, an algorithm is something you use so that a computer can do some calculations. Let's start with a simple example. Imagine this question. Find the sum of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus on and on until plus 10. Of course, the simplest approach to a question like this would be to add each term one by one, on and on and on, to finally reach your answer, 55. But this approach is tedious, especially if we had to add many more numbers. Imagine another question like the following. Find the sum of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus on and on until plus 1000. Again, we can indeed try to add the terms one by one, which I won't do because it's just too much work. But if you have managed to get to the end without making a mistake, you will find out that the sum of this is equal to 500,500. This method of adding terms one by one is an example of a very simple algorithm, though it is very inefficient. That is, if we were to add from one through n, some arbitrary number n, then we would have to perform n minus one calculations. And that becomes very difficult for large numbers of n, as we just saw. Instead, a very famous approach to this question can cut the number of calculations required significantly. By writing the sum in the question like this, and then backwards, then we can add the terms like this, and in our example, adding 1 to 10, we get 1 plus 10 equals 11, 2 plus 9 equals 11, 3 plus 8 equals 11, and so on, with each term adding to 11. Clearly, we have 10 of these, so twice the sum, because we wrote the sum twice, of 1 through 10 equals 11 times 10, or 110. Therefore, our sum from 1 through 10 is 55. With the example of finding the sum from 1 to 1000, we can use a similar approach. This time, instead of 10 plus 1, it is 1000 plus 1 equals 1001, and instead of 10 pairs, we have a thousand pairs, so twice the sum of 1 to 1000 is 1000 times 1001, which equals a million and a thousand. And finally, dividing by 2 gives us the sum of 500,500. This is a much more efficient algorithm requiring only three calculations given some value of n we want to add to. So if we want to find the sum from 1 through n, we add 1 to n, multiply that number by n, and finally divide by 2. And this will give us the sum. So when taking a large n, like n equals 10 to the 100, it becomes very useful to have these efficient algorithms as it provides us with the answer in a much more reasonable time. Say you are given a list of numbers sorted in ascending order like the following. Your task is to look at the list and see if a certain number exists in the list or not. Let's say the number 2, placed right here. Or the number 73, placed right here. Again, a simple approach would require you to look through each of these numbers from the top until you have found or went past the number you were looking for to determine if it's there. Once again, for an extremely large list, this would take too much time. Let's try a different approach this time, only looking at the columns. If you go over the number you want to find, then it must have been in the previous row. So then you can just search through that row to see if the number is there. This is much more efficient than the previous method, but could still be sped up by utilizing something known as a binary search. In a binary search, you look at the midpoint of the list you have not yet checked to determine whether to look at a smaller or larger area. 
While we could use binary search twice on the row and column, let's rewrite this list as just one straight unidimensional list. We will try to find the number 73 again. In this list of 25 numbers, we will first look at the middle number, the 13th number to be exact, which turns out to be 41. Now the number we want to look for, 73, is greater than 41, so we don't have to worry about any of the numbers smaller than 41 at this point. Now let's look at the midpoint between the 13th and 25th number, which turns out to be 13 plus 25 over 2 is the 19th number on the list, which is 67. Now, 73 is still larger than 67, so next we will look at the midpoint of these two numbers. Now, the midpoint between the 19th and 25th number is the 22nd number, which is 79. 79 is bigger than 73, so we have to look between the 19th and 22nd number now. The midpoint between these two numbers to so the nearest hole is the 21st number, which turns out to be 73. Therefore, we can say that 73 is in the list of these numbers. Now let's say the number you were looking for was instead 72. Now you know the number has to be between the 19th or 21st number, and so you look at the midpoint again, which is the 20th number, which is 71. Now 72 is bigger than 71, so you want to look between the 20th and 21st number, but because these are two adjacent numbers, you now know that 72 can't exist in this list. Now, this is a much more efficient algorithm than just looking at the 25 numbers one by one, or looking at the five rows and columns, because you only have to look at five numbers in the worst case scenario, at which point you will be able to determine whether your number is in the list or not. Maybe you've used a similar approach in places elsewhere, for instance, when you want to look up a definition to a word on a dictionary, you might have used something similar to a binary search. You open some page, probably near the middle, see if the word is somewhere earlier or later, and then decide where to look next. DP, or dynamic programming, is a unique kind of algorithm that utilizes recursive patterns that have repeated uses of certain values. For instance, when calculating the Fibonacci sequence, we can find the nth term by using dynamic programming. By saving the previous values of the Fibonacci sequence on a list, or on an array like the following, we can continuously use this list to find the next terms of the Fibonacci sequence relatively quickly. So, starting with f0 equals f1 equals 1, we have f2 equals 2, f3 equals 3, f4 equals 5, and so on. We just need to add the previous two terms and bring it to the next, just like in the definition. A more inefficient version of this, say if we want to calculate f10, we would expand it like f10 equals f9 plus f8 equals f8 plus 2 f7 plus f6 equals on and on and on until you, you get to f0 or f1, at which case you will resubstitute it with 1. But without doing that, with this method, we can use this table to add it from the bottom up, saving us much time. Another example is finding the minimum number of coins required to pay a certain amount. Say in some arbitrary country, you have access to 1, 8, and 13 dollar coins. You want to find out the minimum number of coins required to pay, say, $38. Though it would make sense to pay with the bigger coins first and then head to smaller coins in order, that wouldn't necessarily be the minimum coins required. That is, while using two $13 coins and then one $8 coin, followed by four $1 coin does indeed add to $38, it requires a total of eight coins to accomplish where in reality, you only need five coins. To be guaranteed to find this minimum value, we can utilize dynamic programming. That is, if we were to have some array P, where Pn represented the minimum coins required to pay n dollars, Pn equals the minimum of Pn minus one, 
pn minus 8, pn minus 13, plus 1, as we can add one coin to any of the coin combinations that add to n minus $1, n minus $8, or n minus $13 to reach n dollars. Let's actually try to do this by hand. And so completing the table using this equation, we can use an algorithm that is much more efficient than just trying each combination of coins to see if they work. This is especially true for larger values of n, and if there were more than just three kinds of coins like in this example. So how does this really come into play with the real world? In reality, we're not stuck with weird combinations of coins with arbitrary value, instead we use bills and coins that make finding the optimal method of pay pretty clear. But these algorithms have been and will be very useful to us. For instance, we have the needleman wunsch algorithm, a kind of dynamic programming used to efficiently compare DNA sequences. Another example is an algorithm known as the Dijkstra's algorithm, and it also plays a large role in society. For instance, when you open Google Maps and select two locations to find the shortest path to get there, chances are Dijkstra's algorithm is used to find the distance and specific path to take. A similar algorithm is also used on the LinkedIn page, where there is a feature that tells you how close or far a connection is between you and another person. Efficient algorithms play a large role in society, as it allows us to find solutions to more complex scenarios with the same amount of time. While computing power is increasing every year and we are able to do more calculations brute force, these efficient algorithms play a huge role by allowing us to further increase the range of calculations we can complete. For instance, a commercial note PC can be used to perform about 10 to the 8 through 10 to the 9 calculations per second. If we were to use a brute force algorithm that to look through a list of 10 to the 9 numbers in ascending order to see if a certain number exists, we would need to perform about 10 to the 9 comparisons in the worst case scenario. However, with binary search, we would only need to perform about 30 calculations, which goes to show how large of a difference these algorithms can make. And so, algorithms have been, and will be, a very essential part of society for many years to come. This has been an introductory episode into algorithms, its real-world use, and how they are so important. If you are still here, thank you for sticking by. I hope you enjoyed the video, and hope to see you in another one soon.